the problems that we have ahead of us from the day we have to get back in our society that we are doing. Keep solving major problems uh, with energy dependence for our climate change or health care. Think, if you're looking at things in a new way, doing things differently, which is what the energy is all about. But innovation is not just economic, it's not just about quality of life, it's also very personal. And the interesting thing is I got into trying to talk about how do I describe what I've experienced in my life because I've been exposed to this incredibly innovative environment. How do I explain that to people? And when I came up with the method of the framework to talk about innovation, I realized that we are the same concept applied to us as people as these organizations, as these companies. And the fact of the matter is that you need to be innovative as an individual in order to have an advantage of innovation and in order to succeed economically in that business. But innovation does not just happen, and it needs to be nurtured. And um, at both this point in my talk, there's also the thing that's happening in the state of California, and I'm talking about it, who are sitting there saying, what the hell is she talking about? There is so much innovation around. Look at all of the big tech startups. Look at all of the interesting things going on. Well, the fact of the matter is that um, if we take a step back and look overall, we have actually become more and more short term focused, more and more short sighted. And I think it's just uh, we did before the financial crisis. I thought I was going to have to try to convince people that we had an economic problem when we get to now. As I launched it in the beginning of September, um, I did not have to convince people that we had an economic problem. But um, we don't just have a budget deficit in this country, we have an innovation deficit. So, what does that mean? We have lots of incremental innovation going on, which is based on things that are 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But we are not currently seeing that we need for innovation to thrive. And I realized that frankly, my son and you will not have the same opportunity that I had in my career. Doesn't mean you won't be as successful. It probably will. I expect most of you to go on and do great things. But I, uh, my career was built in an environment that supported that kind of innovation. And increasingly, the environment has become more frigid. And so the, the passion that led me to write the book was the fact that, oh my gosh, my so my son and his generation and the generation that follows for the first time in this country are going to have it worse than than my generation had it. And that's really what the the, the passion and reason why um, I decided to to write the book and put it in the book. So let me get in and, and, and talk a little bit more about this and what why you want to talk about innovation. And the first thing to understand is that um, when people talk about innovation, they're often talking about different things. And there are really, I believe, three different types of innovation. And the first two are very common in people's lexicon. lexicon. The first is breakthrough, something that is just completely brand new. The sentence that was a breakthrough innovation. The credit card was a breakthrough innovation in the non technology. And the interesting thing about a breakthrough is you, know, you don't know it's a breakthrough until later. Because when it actually happens, you don't know what it's going to happen. And the discovery of DNA, the RDNA. When it actually happens, or it's imminent, you don't really know how significant the breakthrough is going to be. It's just going to be something that's going to be here. Because breakthroughs in itself is not often enough to solve a problem. It's a breakthrough discovery, but it is then incremental innovation that takes that breakthrough and applies it to solving different problems and uh, rough, rough, rough the out the edges and completes it so that you can actually use whatever discovery or technology is. So you need a, a, a combination of breakthrough innovation and incremental innovation. Now, given the state of technology today, I actually think there's a third type of innovation, which is not quite just one or the other. One or the other. It is um, breakthrough in that it 
is disrupting it. Some people don't call this racism in the they call it disrupting it in the And it's what I call orthogonal innovation. And orthogonal innovation comes from not breakthroughs in technology, but breakthroughs in invention, but in combining existing innovation in a different way to solve a problem. And the reason I call it orthogonal innovation is it's usually driven by looking at a problem differently. And looking at the problem, the two best examples for uh, a thoughtful innovation are the iPod. Now, the iPod is, was disrupted not because of its first packaging. It was disrupted because Apple did not set out to build an MP3 player, but set out to build a new music experience. And that was solving a different problem than anybody in the industry It was looking at the problem differently. In a whole different industry, how many of you have heard of something called Wonder Woman? Must have had presentations on the TikTok. But as everybody knows, electric vehicles, one of the biggest challenges is how you extend the lifetime of the battery. How you make the battery so that you don't have to take the little short trips and don't want to plug it in. Well, what a better place to do is look at it, look at the problem differently, and say if you had an infrastructure of gas stations or battery stations, then suddenly the lifetime of the battery. It's not as critical. And if you could go swap your battery in five minutes, you have a different, uh, uh, you solve the problem in a different way. So that's a great example of orthogonal innovation. Now, the key thing is one of these is not, sorry, not better than the other. You need to have them in balance. And when I talk about a deficit, I, it's that we are having increasingly been targeted, focusing on the incremental innovation. Because it's easier, it's quicker, it's uh, uh, less capital intensive and less risky. Now, another uh, reason is that, um, I want to get to this in a minute. Uh, the risk, though, of open incremental innovation is that uh, uh, disruptive innovation, which is uh, either breakthrough or orthogonal, can create new industries and markets. That's what you need for future growth. Incremental is necessary, but not sufficient in terms of long term growth. So, if you are the country, if you're thinking about the country, we need a new industry if we're ever going to get ourselves out of the unemployment situation we're in now. We cannot get uh, reduced significantly the unemployment numbers with existing industries. We need completely new growth for new industries. If you're a company, you eventually are going to hit a level where your growth is going to slow unless you have new markets that you can open that can create uh, growth. So you need both of these. Now, an interesting thing that can happen is as companies have more and more information about their customers, and the internet has certainly helped this, and as managers are trained, and this is a good thing, to be more and more customer focused get more and more customer driven, there is an unintended consequence. Because if you drive your innovation based on what your customers are asking for, you will have only incremental innovation. Because the customers don't know what might be or what could be, and often don't know what is out there two, three, four years from now. So this intense need to uh, manage the metrics and, and so carefully find what the customers are asking for has driven a lot of companies to focus more and more on incremental innovation. And you need both, as I said, you need a balance. Now, all three of them are needs driven. And sometimes it's simply a need to understand when you're talking about basic research, it's a need to understand the phenomenon that then leads to innovation to solve problems. Sometimes it's a need uh, need of society or a need of the industry. Um, so again, another thing is, I say I'm not against incremental innovation, but companies and countries and the planet needs to be very careful not to so focus on incremental innovation that we should jump out the other. The other thing that I think is very hard about innovation, and especially this is to the more distracted you get, the messier the process is. And one of the reasons why 
in a culture, in a corporate culture, in a society where we increasingly focus on productivity and accountability. Accountability is an important thing, but accountability and culture and measurement are very hard to apply to the next culture. And when you're talking about more disruptive innovation, the more disruptive it is, the more you have to hear uh, the process. You have to be willing to invest without knowing what the outcome is going to be. And that outcome might be failure that you learn from, but it may not actually be success. There is a process here that you can start with identifying needs, training questions that you then come up with ideas, you try and test, you assess and learn. But at any given time, you might go back to a new need or train a different question or try and test a different idea. And so, how many times you go through that list before you end up with an innovation? Who knows? Or you may end up at all. Um, someone who was a teacher of Jurassic Park, maybe he wasn't quite sure he was a said, you know, can you give your sense of uh, what the project dynamics are and what it should be? And the board of directors kind of looked like, okay, I have to budget that with people. And then he said, I don't know what you're speaking to. So that is the trick to, again, the more disruptive it is, the more ambiguity you have to deal with. Um, the other thing is that innovation builds on innovation. And so, again, if you don't have enough of that foundation, then ultimately you will wither in terms of what is built on top of it. Um, talent is absolutely critical when it comes to innovation. Uh, it, it, I'll get to this in a minute, but innovation is all about people. And when you talk about talent in the innovation uh, sphere, it's not just skill and aptitude, which is true in most cases, but it's also passion and drive. And um, it, 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 those people who are best at innovation, and again, I'll talk about the core values in a minute, but are often uh, need to be critical options. You have to be optimistic and have that drive to keep going, but you have to have enough self-doubt to critically self-assess and to look at whether your drive is taking you in the right direction and have the flexibility to move around. Um, when you're looking at innovation, small teams tend to work much better than large teams. And again, when you're talking about the second, you're talking about the most disruptive innovation, or I would argue the most incremental uh, innovation. And there, there's been a phrase in Silicon Valley for a long time that the big teams um, like to use, which is uh, super to one team, is what they call it, because it can be no bigger than it could be said by two pieces. Um, the, uh, when I was interviewing for my book, uh, Henry Curie, uh, one of the most recent pieces, Gave me another term that I just love, and it can be a good view of what innovation teams are all about. And he said it should be more larger than a jazz team. And the reason why this is so applicable in innovation is that jazz musicians are independent but play off each other. It's the synergy of them playing off of each other that creates the phenomenal music. There is no conductor. And once a group gets big enough that it needs a conductor, then you lose that magic of what makes jazz jazz. And so this notion of no bigger, no larger than jazz jazz teams that can play off of each other. And the other thing that is um, very important is that diversity is really critical when it comes to innovation. And I'm not talking here about race or gender. What I'm talking about is cognitive diversity. You want teams who have different experiences and look at problems in different ways. The same way jazz musicians play different instruments, because that's where the depth of beauty is of the melody. And um, the other thing that I would say, it's a topic of innovation, that um, there, all people have embraced the notion of local innovation, which I believe in. I can take it in its more uh, simplistic form. That you should not feel that all innovation needs to come from inside, that all ideas uh, need to be internally driven. Some companies have gone to the extreme to decide that they will be instrumental innovation internally, but look outside for anything that is uh, disruptive and breakthrough or even at all future. The, the 
But one thing to keep in mind is you have to be able to know one. And so when you talk about companies that uh, go to that extreme, if you don't have great internal talent, you are not going to collaborate with great talent. You are not going to find the best company. And in order to have great internal talent, you better be doing some innovation internally, and you're not going to attract the best people. So you really need to get a mix of um, internal talent and the openness to collaborate with uh, companies or uh, organizations externally. And this applies to silos within a company as well as between companies and between uh, departments of the university and the university. When I uh, thought about how to explain, when I came up with the term uh, sustainability, um, it occurred to me that um, when I think about innovation, and when I think about what it takes for innovation to thrive, then it really gives um, life a biological significance. Now, for those of you who think it's um, a business school, we use the term ecosystem in the business world very differently. The ecosystem in the business world is about partnerships and APIs and companies that work together. I'm talking here about a biological ecosystem. And the definition of a biological ecosystem is communities of living organisms that interact with each other, to exchange nutrients, and interact dynamically with their environment. So when you think about, and it's very important to a biological ecosystem, it is not simply that to sustain life. When it takes off balance, it is not sustainable. Uh, it is not sustainable. So if you apply this to innovation, what is an innovation ecosystem? Whether it is within a company, within a country, or uh, looking at it from a global perspective, there are three communities uh, required for innovation to be sustainable. There is the research community, which has been uh, very much forgotten in, in this country. Um, and the research community is about uh, uh, new discoveries about further understanding about whatever field that it's talking about. Um, but almost as important as further understanding is the community about training new minds. Because it is in the research community that people learn how to think critically and how to think about innovation. There's the development community. That's the one that most people talk about. It's developing new products and services um, in innovative ways. And there's the application community, which is about applying new products and services in innovative ways. So if you think about healthcare, healthcare is an application. A doctor um, or a hospital may use uh, new medicines or new uh, technology or IT to be to, uh, Solve uh, a problem in a different way. You're more innovative in the way you apply uh, health. And when you think about the healthcare problem in this country, it actually, yes, uh, there's, there's people in development, there's security and innovation, but we've gotten to the point now where the biggest mix, the way that you can be the most innovative, has to do with the application part of our very, very complex uh, healthcare system. Um, these are not alone. It is not research, development, and application, but they are a circle because they all need to exchange nutrients. And it's very important to have feedback from the application community into the research community, as well as the development and vice versa. We want questions and needs and information to go to all of the communities for it to have uh, innovation to thrive. Um, let me just give you two quick examples of these communities. Look at Google. Here's the Google entry. They started out in the research community, an interesting search algorithm. They started a company with an innovative product. Actually, not that innovative a product, but search engine. Now, the Google data is about it, it was simpler than their search engine because it was a white page and that was all it did. But why is Google Google? Because of their innovation in the application community. It was their time advertising to search in an innovative way and, uh, and coming up with an IT infrastructure that allowed them to scale profitably 
that has made you a sense of success. Now, obviously, there's marketing and all of these other things, but the, the, the barriers to entry really came from innovation to the application community. And most people would not think of that when they think of it. Now, let's pop all the way up to one of our big problems. Um, and it is a company in the Well, if you think of that, we need to get some of the the We need less uh, oil. We need to lower our carbon footprint. We need new products that are more energy efficient productivity. But we also need to be investing in research, not just in renewable form of energy, but in understanding environmental change. Because as we change our behavior, if we don't have ongoing research looking at the impact of that behavioral change and, and continuing research in environmental science, how will we ever know if we're actually going to be in the right direction? So, whether you're talking about a company or some of the global problems we have, we need, again, balance to all three of these communities in the research. And unfortunately, again, the research area is the part where we have uh, not been invested about. Now, I think that when you're talking, so just let me say that balance does not mean equal investment. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't mean you invest the same number of dollars. Um, but I actually think you need balance over a long period of time as you get out of something is when you end up paying for it. However, with a company, if you're talking about investment, you might for periods of time increase your investment in certain areas over others as long as you don't fool yourself that if you're decreasing investment that you're going to have some consequences of that. Um, so again, balance is different for every company. And this is more, you might think of this more as a framework in which you could use to audit a company or audit a problem by saying, let's go look at what we're doing in different areas and whether it's where we want to be consistent with our goals and our strategies. Some companies um, and some industries need more investment in the future. If you're running a company that you know you're going to sell in two years and it's a short term play, then that company is not going to invest in you. So it balances different for each element. But as a company, we need balance to have. If, if we want a long term sustainable economy, and I don't. I mentioned earlier that, um, that, that there are these two things and they interact with their environment. So in biology, what's the environment? It is uh, air, water, sunlight. In innovation, what are the environmental effects? What impacts innovation? It is leadership, funding, policy, education, and culture. And the most important ones are leadership and culture. Because if you end up with the right answer, you probably will make the right decisions on funding, policy, and education. But leaders' jobs are really to set a vision, set a, have a shared purpose, and then take down barriers to innovation. The reason culture is so important is in the end, innovation is bottom up. It comes from the people. And if you don't have the environment where people are empowered, and I'll come back to this in a minute, to innovate, uh, that can happen. Now, I'll put policy here from a, 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 a political perspective or a country perspective. Policy is just that policy. If you're looking at this for an organization, policy are the procedures you use in that organization. It might be the employment systems, it might be what type of meetings you have, it might be how you choose to promote or who you hire. So, 
um, this is an education that is something that is changed and is dependent on the person. So these factors, again, apply at company level or at a country level. So let me just talk a little bit more about the culture level since that's uh, important to me. Um, a lot of people ask me, okay, so what makes things like this in the And can we be negligent? Can we be decent? Can we be kind to people want to be? And I spent a lot of time thinking about this because I actually started out thinking, you know, there is no formula to do this. And there's lots of different types of stuff and lots of different ways to do this. And then I realized that when I went to class, that changed the environment I can do this. And the people that I had met who are the most innovative, um, and the or the people I went to the gym, um, the people were so simplistic. So I can actually um, narrow down to five key elements that were critical if you were going to have an innovative person or an innovative environment. And in the end, what innovation is and requires is a capacity to think. The organization that is giving you the idea to have a capacity for change that is willing to accept change. So what, what are those four methods? Questioning uh, seems obvious and it starts with the question. Curiosity is a very important part of innovation. How can I do this better? What does the company need? Why does this work the way it is? But questioning is also self-assessment. It's not enough to just ask that initial question, as I mentioned earlier. You need to be able to self assess. Very important is how you frame a question. If you ask a broad question, you'll get more disruptive, likely to get more disruptive innovation. If you narrow and focus a question, you'll get more focused answers. And there are times to focus, and there are times to press. So, how you frame a question. And people who think about innovation, you should spend as much time framing the question as the work you're doing is doing. Because framing that question is very important. The other thing is how you ask questions. And as a board member, as a leader, as a parent, I've come to learn that if you ask the questions that are necessary to yourself or to others, you come back. You get your motivation. If you ask inquisitively, that engenders innovation. So how you ask the question, and one of the problems with corporate governance over the last um, five years ever since the corporate scandal happened when we're talking about. Um, but ever since the corporate scandal, but now again with the financial meltdown, is that boards have become an adversarial because they think they were they they just think you're not doing your job and their reaction is to start getting really judgmental. That's terrible in terms of the impact on the dynamic of being an engineering board. And there are ways to provide oversight and to ask questions and to be inquisitive, not be uh, judgmental. The second is risk. What is risk? It's a willingness to fail. It's being vulnerable. It's open to failure. If you are not willing to try something that might fail, you will not be able to fail. If you are afraid of failure, you will be little bit successful in terms of, uh, of innovation. So this notion of uh, failure being the step to success figuring out how to create environments where it's safe to fail, and learning from failure, and uh, uh, celebrating certain failures. And again, not failure of ethics, not failure of execution, but sometimes ideas don't turn out to be. Uh, sometimes you really as much to be failure as you want to be in success. Openness to imagine to data, uh, to new data, to serendipity, and this is something as you become more and more productive, you don't need to be for serendipity. Some of the most <clears throat> important inventions of uh, Pentecost, Viagra, and Ethernet came about because a researcher was, uh, saw a data point that was outside of their sphere of where they were going and they were willing to be open to look at that data. So um, openness is not just a concept in terms of um, open collaboration, which is a very, very important part of innovation, it's a state of mind, and it's that openness to take a state of mind. And again, you have to be open to change, because someone can come up with a great new idea, but if nobody is willing to change and to adapt to it, nothing happens. Patience, this is the hardest thing. Um, patience is an innovator's capacity, but patience in a leader or an investor needs patience 
at least give something a chance to grow. Give something a chance to go through those uh, iterations of uh, uh, um, the, the process. And then, so that's what I didn't have this thing. I was kind of took for granted. And then I realized that you can't have the first two or three months of our success. And you need to create an environment of trust. If people are going to be vulnerable to fail, if people are going to be open, if people are going to uh, take their time and trust in yourself, to make trust in others. But this is also where the safety and all that comes to come from. And trust in God allow you to try something to fail. Knowing that your kids can have schools to go to, um, hopefully they schools, um, and affordable health care are part of the safety net of the country that allows them to go and get out and become an entrepreneur. So it is uh, uh, trust means a lot of different things. Now, did I say this is just one instead of trying to get to the next one I had a baby? Here again, they have to come in combination so I can get the quick example. Um, one is that trust is our question with blind faith. And blind faith is not the extreme of the Blind faith is just following, not an extreme of the Unfortunately, a more relevant one, it was impatient people who took risks without asking questions, without the openness and transparency as to what they were even taking risks on that led to our financial meltdown last year. And then what happened is we lost trust. People didn't know what everybody's down to. It looked like they stopped running, and the people in the country lost trust in business and lost trust in the government. So you end it up, if you're going to get a, a perfect picture of what happens with the country's mind is for value, as opposed to the experience is for value. And the reason I think this is so important is that um, if you're setting policy, if you're in a company and coming up with incentive systems, if you as an individual are, think, are in a bind, are stuck, if we are thinking about how to educate our kids, if we would only think about are we encouraging to be trying for value or are we stifling to think for ourselves, we would do a much better job at taking in and thinking something. If you think about it, kids are born with all the things. And then we take them through our school system and we actually, uh, well, our genetic capacity, not the other things. So um, it, it, these, these are really important things to keep in mind as we think about. Okay, so I'm going to put. You know, I, I think that uh, if, if a culture encompasses those five core values, then I think you are more likely to encourage innovation. But I think they are more than that, I think they are also expensive. That we ought to hold up as we think about how we should educate, for instance. Or it's a template that you should hold up as you hire, as you're interviewing people. If you want to interview innovative people, when I'm interviewing people, I actually care more about the questions they ask me than I do about what they should answer. So I guess that that is just how they frame questions and what questions they come up with are as interesting to me as what I might ask them. So, um, it is uh, what you said, it is a template for um, if you encourage those four values, you will more likely have a culture which is innovative. Um, but I think it also can be used as a template for innovation. No question that the, the, the issues we have as a country are way more complicated and complex and harder than in the country. You can don't underestimate uh, how hard it is for an individual or a company 
the answers to large companies and to small companies. What you're talking about is startups, which uh, you need to be very open in the beginning until you come up with your idea. Then you focus in until you get something that is a thing. But then you need to be open again as you get feedback about that idea. And then you need to focus in again as you identify markets. And so if you're a small company, it's just process of time. You open up a certain time and you focus in as a small. If you're a large company and you already have a strategy, you have a market, and you have a successful business model, and decide on this in a minute, then what you need to do is have your mainstream business managed in one way, and yet have areas in the company that allow for more disruptive innovation. You have to separate out the disruptive innovation from the incremental innovation because it is counterintuitive to your mainstream business to be led the way you need to be to the disruptive innovation. So you actually need to separate that out. You know, one of the things about innovation, and one of the things about this, so um, I, I find this term in my book, I call it the Amazon Leadership, because I was reading about six years ago, and I was having these kind of black belts and brown belts, and I go around teaching people how to, uh, you know, make sure there are zero defects and uh, no room for any surprises, because that's what you want in a good mainstream business. Um, and then I realized that the fact about the fact of the matter is leading innovation. It's a different skill. It's instinct. It's, it's dealing with ambiguity. It's judgment. It's, there is no rule. And so I came up with the notion that it's more like gardening than karate. And you need to give me some as opposed to a black belt or a brown belt. And a lot of these questions, there isn't a top answer. And it has to do with if you have leaders who are thinking about and organizing on a free horizon of innovation. You have to kind of keep this in mind. There's your current customer that you need to always be satisfied. So that's your current generation of products that you need to stay out front in the innovation. There's the next generation to your current customer base, which is allows you to stay ahead so nobody leapfrogs you. And then there's future growth. And that future growth is the smallest part today, but it could become a very big part five to ten years from now. And so, depending on who you are, if you're Microsoft, you can put a lot of money, money into future growth. If you are intuitive surgical that builds medical devices, you might have two people who are thinking about future growth. If you are Intel, you might have a bunch of people inside and then you create a little lab list that connects to universities that are doing this future growth. So, it really depends on, um, part of it depends on are you in a mature industry? If you're in the mature industry and you don't have a significant investment in future growth, you're in trouble. Because your mature industry is going to flatten out. If you're at the beginning, if you're where Razor Cisco was in the 80s, you don't have to worry about your industry because the networking industry has a lot of growth in it. So it has to do with where you are in the industry cycle, where you are competitively. But the main thing is that leaders need to not forget that these three horizons exist and that you consciously trade off and make conscious decisions about your strategy. I think that the lesson that people say that focus is the most important thing in a company, actually, you need that time. And you have to have the right amount of focus for the right time. So you have to decide, again, um, the way uh, I recommend people do is they, they recognize that the mainstream businesses are like that and farms. And then they need to create small gardens, as many now do, that are managed differently. So the first decision you have to make is how much money you call the company you want to allocate to more disruptive innovation or partner with people for disruptive innovation. That seems to depend on how big you are and your industry. The second thing to do is once you do that, you've got to protect it. You've got to protect it because your mainstream businesses will always say, I need $5 million more for my market today. So $5 million to uh, 
Google's marketing budget is nothing. Five million is a new budget, it's a lot. And so as a leader, you have to actually protect one of the things you have to do is make sure that you're nurturing and protecting those guardians from being killed off by the elements. And the elements are your main three missions. So you have to know how much you need. What does the best thing for it? You really need to do a job excellently. And what do you want to invest in the more disruptive? And then the people who read those writings, they need to be constantly planting lots of seeds and then cleaning them in. You have to know when to stop something, when to give it more time, so it's going to be able to do that. So people who are great at that. But you can't take a manager that is great in the factory farm area and put them in those writings. I'm not criticizing Six Sigma. Six Sigma is what it was designed for was manufacturing and the factory farm company. And Six Sigma for continuous improvement and incremental innovation, it's it's great. I mean, I I personally have never been involved in it directly, but FedEx uses those types of things. And it's when they get their service. But the problem I have is people, and especially the people who teach Six Sigma and write books about it and are invested in that concept, they want to build their market. So they decide they're going to take Six Sigma. And I'll tell you, managers and leaders are way more comfortable with Six Sigma than they are with innovation. Because you can measure you can, it. It's in a book. Everything is very easy to teach. But I'll tell you, if you're talking about more disruptive innovation, it will kill it. it. And many of our companies have become so focused on the system that they leave no room. If you have no slots on the system, you, you kill that uh, growth. And actually, three of them is an interesting case study for us because they had a very innovative theory of their system. They brought in a new CEO, they brought in six sigma. And I don't have all the data, but you can actually um, go see how they're, they're actually they their self testing up for a while, but they almost killed the spectrum of innovation. And then the next five and ten years said, look, we've got to keep this, the six sigma in its box, and we can exhaust this notion of long term innovation. So I'm not going to help the stigma, it has its place, but its place is not in the stigma. Okay, I'm going to just quickly say I have two more slides here and then we have some time for questions. Um, I wanted to um, uh, just talk a little bit and just give you my perspective on uh, looking forward. And so, where are the, um, uh, it occurred to me that you can sit in there and have to go and see the so, um, I thought I'd give you my perspective of what are those industries that really are going to drive innovation in the future. And if you think about it, the past, my, uh, in my generation, there were um, two major growth industries. Forget about financial services and so on. And uh, I think that was done. I'm sure it was uh, created in a bubble in and of itself. But I'm talking about the year of the science and technology and innovation and products. And the first was productivity. And most of IT, students of communication, is driven by productivity and communication, enterprises and individuals. And whether it's helping people communicate, helping people do their work better, and then curing illness. So a lot of growth in medicine and med tech, biotech, med tech arenas, which were all about curing illnesses. If you look to the future, um, it's not going to be the same industry of the past. If you look at where the opportunities are, um, I really think that there are three main areas. 
the first one is um, is the hardest one to characterize, and that is that there are all sorts of industries that are being disrupted. And when industries are disrupted, there is opportunity for new innovation to come in. And whether it is uh, how we interact socially, our commerce, entertainment, education, it's all being disrupted because of the internet and because of a focus on it's no longer the corporation going out to consumers, but it's about individuals connecting amongst themselves and coming back to the corporation. So the, the internet, whether it is blogging uh, and Twitter and its impact on everything from politics to uh, the print industry, whether it's the internet impact on the entertainment industry, video games, whether it is how we educate and personalize education, all of those industries are right for disruption. So there will be a lot of change. Uh, some of it will actually um, start to happen before it can actually help. But the two areas that are right for uh, creating the economic growth that we need in this country are anything driven by energy and environment, anything from uh, new building materials to coat windows to solar panels to electric cars to um, uh, uh, lowering our carbon footprint to investing in renewable energy, and expanding our definition of healthcare. So we will continue to be about uh, uh, curing illness, but healthcare is not just about curing illness. It is also about wellness. It's about preventative care. It's about care for the elderly. It's about how we deliver healthcare. Whether it is clinics or using IT to uh, have electronic patient records, and all of those areas of healthcare that haven't been explored as much in the past are going to be huge opportunities um, as we look towards the future. But in all of these, and especially these two, are complex and interdisciplinary problems, and they take multiple fields and multiple people working together to make them happen. And they're not as easy as a person with a computer. And if we're going to reignite the innovation we need to actually address these, there's, there's a set of things that actually I'm um, not going to do. I'm just going to touch on a couple of things at a time. The first one, let me say, is that in this country, we need innovation not just in products, but in services, but in manufacturing. If we do not figure out how to have manufacturing in this country without being protectionist, we have a real problem. And the only way to do that is to find these strong mechanisms of it, to make sure that these new industries, and, and what breaks my heart is to see these exciting new solar companies going offshore and manufacturing their solar panels, that then they are going to ship back here. And they are going to cost the money to ship back here. Or because other markets are going to buy those solar companies because they're not going to buy them here. Or electric batteries because it's an evolution of the consumer electronic battery technology that we gave away as a country. So thinking about manufacturing and thinking cleverly about manufacturing is not mundane. It is really, really important to the economic cost. So I think it's something that we see here today is without the protection because if we, in this global environment, we've got to fight too far in the other direction. The other thing is to remember that um, you're going to hear someone from Google next week. And you look at how Google does say this, and there's this tendency um, to say, well, why can't everybody do it that way? Well, you know what? If you're in the consumer internet space or in the software space, it's really easy to try this and to just throw it up and see if it works. But if you are building an electric battery or a new drug to cure the disease or a medical device or, 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 it's not so easy. And you can't get to failure and you can't try to get to failure. So you really need different tools for different industries. And as you become thinking about innovation, what the mechanism that applies to a computer internet startup is very different than um, what works in biotech, although those core values uh, remain the same. The, the other thing I wanted to say is that 
we've had so many problems built into our education system. You know, you go to your end goal, you can be an investment banker, or you want to go to uh, work in business. When do you have to make that decision? And how, if you're an engineer, when are you deciding what track you're on? In fact, we felt those silos in high school as we're deciding where we want to go. And these silos actually are out of our own fashion. The, the notion of these silos work that is just a simple challenge. And the problems and challenges we have are. Uh, Given the complexity, is we need to break down the silos. So whether it's between communities and the ecosystem, between research and application and development, between fields of expertise, between generations, um, I have a lot of people who have companies who you guys may have read some of these articles where they think they need to change their culture because you're coming into the workplace and um, you guys need to now describe the same thing as the hierarchy. But we know how to use technology, and so companies uh, say, okay, we need to change our culture for the new generation. So the fact of the matter is what companies should really do, and what academic institutions should do, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a bit clear, but let me get the best of your generation and my generation. Now done together, because the baby boomers were taught at a different time. And People going through the school system now, and I hope I don't mistake anything in saying this, but too often you're taught to think in Taliban terms. And if you think in board, you're not going to do something too quickly. So the education system has changed, and that's where there's a workplace to get the cognitive diversity of generation as well as experience will benefit as opposed to assuming one or the other. And clearly, politically, and culturally. When we think about what we need as talent, we need that first. We still need the best first in certain areas. But we need what I feel is coined as key people, people who are deep in expertise, but are able to communicate across disciplines. And then I actually believe we need those people, people who have some depth in multiple disciplines and can go out, and what I call connected. And connectors are people who actually may not have a lot of depth in anything, but have that ability to bring people together. And if you think about one of the most important elements in open innovation, it's connectors. But one of the problems is when you're having layoffs, there's no PL associated with the connectors. And it's those connectors that are often let go. But they are often the glue or the, the oil that makes the company work. And let me just finish by. Um, uh, one last word about leadership and training. And a lot of people talk about stress being motivated um, to innovation. And there's no question that necessity is the mother of innovation. But there is a difference between a stress and challenge. And in fact, fear discourages innovation. It does not encourage innovation. Psychologically, if you are told to be a threat, a prey, if you are shown threat, whether it's an economic threat or a threat of terrorism, and you are not given any way to be involved, i.e., you're helpless, it actually turns off the executive function in your brain, which is what generates leadership and innovation. But there is something you can do, which is if you take a threat, and you convert that threat into a challenge and use that challenge to inspire people, then suddenly you turn on that executive function, and that is how you get innovation. And that's harder. It takes more time. It's not easier to say, boo, you scared somebody, or say they're a terrorist out there. Go stop it. But this notion of taking challenges, and it is true also, um, I don't know how many of you are kind of tied into the music community in the valley, but when the economic crisis came up in uh, September, there was a famous panel that went around the valley from Sequoia, one of the biggest tours. And it basically said, rest in peace, good times are over, everybody's had fun at the same time. And it just scared the hell out of all the things that took place in the country. That did nothing to innovation. It was positive to what the message should be to be done. Those new teachers that went to their country and said, look, it's bad. It's going to be bad for a long time. 
So let's go down and get your people involved and figure out how we adjust and what we need to cut and where we need to invest and what we do about that. So those are the things that we've got to do with the most in the and that's the idea to play. No doubt they think that it's not because they want everybody else to uh, act in the same way. But um, this notion of fear working against things is not just a bit applicable to the country right now when you look around you and turn on TV. You realize you've got exactly what people are trying to do to be scared of something that is not changing. But it applies to ourselves and it applies to the uh, company. So it's, it's really important as you go through life that see, see things that are not working or scary to think about taking that step and turning it into a challenge to inspire. And not everyone wants to be a leader of other people, but every one of you is a leader of your own path and a leader of your, uh, your, your community and your sphere. And um, the, the last thing I'll just say is I spent the last nine months talking to lots of different groups of people about innovation. And because of my book came out right into the financial crisis, in every discussion is the discussion of how do, we, how do we get here? How do we fix it? And the most interesting thing to me is the fact that every group I talk to is really ready to point to someone else that needs to say. So the opposite of what you see to be the point to be like, here's the real point. Wall Street, too much government, too little government. It is amazing how quick people are to identify how someone else needs to say. But the fact of the matter is, we all got ourselves into the mess that we're in today. And so really what needs to happen is we all need to be looking at our own roles, our own industries, our own uh, sphere of influence as to how we can. And that's the only way that we will end up moving forward. So I just like to leave you with the thought of it's really easy as other people think change is really hard, but we need to want to fix it. And that's how it's going to be. So that's my first one. Thank you. Take more questions. Usually, when you have, you may have an idea that, uh, and actually, most of my companies um, were ahead of their time. And, and one, one of the big problems you see in the industry today is they want validated markets before they fund. And um, none of my companies have validated markets. I, I would argue that once the market's validated, it's a good guy to do it. And that the role for entrepreneurs is finding markets. And so, um, there's a notion of the one who is the thing that actually, it's different if you think about each case of starting a company. But if you're thinking about the kind of idea of starting a company, you just want to make sure that you, that you in your own mind, when you have that idea, that you can identify an unmet need that you think is solved. Uh, because in the end, if you're at the company stage in that development community, you have to solve some problem or nobody's going to buy it. And if you're starting a company stage, make sure that it meets the need that's going to exist to your team. Because companies take time to, or, you know, depending again on it, um, what it is, maybe it's a website that you get out in 30 days, but it is, um, make sure you're looking forward to. Uh, needs that um, are far enough out of time that match your uh, development cycle. And it doesn't matter. Sometimes it starts with an idea. Sometimes it starts with a certain passion to solve a problem and it takes a while to figure out how to solve it. But I would argue if you get an idea, if you choose that idea in your mind, there are some needs out there that trigger it in the first place.
So the the role of government in the nation is a really important one. I I believe that the role of government is to inspire, is to fund in order to spark innovation. I don't believe the government should pick women, but I think that the government needs to think about where it needs to invest. Research because it's part of the public good as opposed to the social good, whether it's the internet or other things that have happened. And I think it is the role of government to come up with smart policy. Now, that's the hardest part. Because the fact of the matter is that there are places where um, policy is required in order to either um, or uh, regulate something because the fact of the matter is, uh, it's so I heard this, and you guys may have heard this, you may be there for the same thing. I was in conference and I heard Alan Reed go, he was in the middle of the asking me about what happened. And I couldn't believe it. He, he actually, he was talking about one of the, the interesting transition points was when the investment bank, they were putting partnerships. So therefore, they shared the game and they shared in the market. And there was a point at which, and I actually remember this, but it was during the early part of my career, when they went public and they became corporations. Some of the executives at those companies shared in the games but not in the market. And so that marked that nation market. And he said, well, I assume that those executives would act in the best interest of their shareholders. So he was making an assumption about human nature that it would be wonderful if it was true, but the fact of the matter is that at some level, when we are in a system that is so interconnected, we need some level of smart policy. The, the problem is we, we went from a place where, um, you know, when you think about government being the problem as opposed to solving the problem, that has not reached the country's psyche. And there's not a lot of stuff. Now, if you watch TV and you watch the economist ask these things, it's hard to trust that they're going to come up with smart policy. The fact of the matter is, there is certain regulation and policy that is needed. And so, I, I think all you can do is be as vocal and as involved as possible to try to make sure that policy is smart policy. So, I, I happen to be, I'm not here. And, uh, but I happen to be here. We, we have gotten so far in the other direction that we do need some regulation and we do need some of it. Um, uh, when people uh, take insurance and bring down the financial system, uh, I think we need to figure out how to stop that from happening. On the other hand, you have to be very careful. Things like carbon adoption. Even that part, there's nothing that helps companies really provide transparency. It was a, it was a major reaction. So the, the, the policy and regulation is really going to be done minimally and carefully. Mm-hmm. And it's hard. And especially because the country right now is so polarized and so into sound bites and spreading, you know, not having that. That's actually the, the, the hardest thing about the United States right now is we're not in the democracy, the two party democracy is supposed to say we don't have a two party democracy. We just have a party that we can and then a few kind of growing kind of government. And we need better debate than we can in the case of the United States.
I think the video, what's happening in the video game is the same as it is in the happening of the successful about this. It's just, it used to be a very small industry. It used to be relatively not capital intensive and very creative. And it has now become a mainstream industry. Um, it costs as much sometimes to develop a video game as a movie. So the video game business has become like the studio business, which is a very volatile business because it's a hit through the business. Um, so uh, I think these companies have to put more profits into it the same way the entertainment uh, and the studio business has. Um, but I think they have to figure out how to keep the stream of the production going because um, otherwise they're not going to be able to do that. The big guys now, EA, Activision, and solely those who are running like big studios, um, they will, some of them will be stopped. And they better keep their eye on them. And the people in the same way, Disney partnered with the Pixar before they bought them a long time ago. It was their investment in the future. It's the only company that they partnered with with their dreams that they threw up and became part of the industry. 